All right, here we are, uh, the book of Exodus, Exodus for Beginners. This is lesson number seven in that series, title of this, Deliverance Part Two, and uh, the subheading, The Miracle Staff and the Ten Plagues, also Part Two. Now in our last lesson, we reviewed the nine plagues that God sent upon Egypt, not only as a demonstration of his power, but also to accomplish other objectives. First, each plague was a judgment on Egypt's pagan gods in whom this nation trusted. And so God would demonstrate his superiority by manipulating at will the domain that each of these nature gods were supposed to control. So if you look at your charts, you'll note, for example, uh, that uh, polluting the Nile River by changing it to flow with blood instead of water delegitimized uh, the gods uh, Kum and Happy, who were supposed to guard the source of the river and acted as the spirit of the river. Um, polluting the, uh, the air with lice and mosquitoes rendered the god Seb who ruled over the earth and its atmosphere. Uh, sending uh, a nation crushing hail that killed both man and beast showed that Nut, the sky goddess, and Shu, the god of the atmosphere, had no real power to control the sky or the atmosphere when the god of the Israelites decided to act and control and even create weather for his own will and purposes. And so through all of these demonstrations of God's power and domination of each of Egypt's pagan gods, there was one person who refused to acknowledge God's presence or God's power and preeminence. And that of course was the Pharaoh, the God King of Egypt. He at first dismissed the plagues as a better form of magic than what his own magicians could, uh, could conjure up. Even though they recognized and told their king that their signs were indeed done by the finger of God. I mean, the Pharaoh's own magicians uh, acknowledged to the Pharaoh that what was happening was happening by the finger of God. It, it, it wasn't magic. He goes from, he meaning the Pharaoh, he goes from dismissing to deceiving to bargaining with Moses and God. And in the end, he threatens Moses with death should another plague come uh, to pass. And so this brings us uh, to the 10th plague, the final plague where God will strike the highest profile God in Egypt, which was the Pharaoh himself considered the most important God in the pantheon of Egyptian deities. The God as king, the God as ruler, the God as protector of the nation. And so the 10th plague uh, we note is the death of the firstborn male and cattle in Exodus uh, chapter 11. Let's look at our, um, uh, look at our chart here. Um, uh, the death of the firstborn, the intensity of it. Well, real death visited upon every Egyptian firstborn person uh, and animal. So now, you know, it wasn't just suffering. It wasn't just inconvenience. It was actual death. The gods of Egypt, well, uh, a judgment on all Egyptian gods, including and especially the Pharaoh himself. Uh, in the past, Pharaoh had attempted to reduce the Jewish population by killing every male baby. Now, God passes judgment on Egypt by killing every firstborn Egyptian male and uh, cattle. However, no Jews uh, will be uh, destroyed. And of course, the response, the Pharaoh out of despair, finally, releases all of, the, uh, all of the Israelites. So let's read, let's begin reading uh, Exodus uh, chapter 11, 
uh, one to three. A kind of a side note here uh, before we get into the, the actual plague. It says, now the Lord said to Moses, one more plague I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go for, from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that each man ask from his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor for articles of silver and articles of gold. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Furthermore, the man Moses himself was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. And so uh, the passage here seems like a break in the action, but it's necessary information and it's included here. Uh, so to help us clarify uh, future events, for example, the manner that they will leave uh, will not be based on negotiations with the Pharaoh, as was the case in the aftermath of various plagues. Uh, you know, uh, the Pharaoh had kind of negotiated. He said, well, only the men can go or uh, the people can go, but you have to leave your livestock here or you can go, but you can't go too far. This time God says the Pharaoh will drive them out, will force them out of the country. And so God prepares them for this unexpected event ahead of time. So there will be no doubt or hesitation or debate among themselves when the time comes. The second explanation is how they will finance their journey and have a stake in rebuilding their entire lives in the new land. You know, they were slaves. Uh, they didn't profit from their work. They had a place to live and they had a few animals and household furnishings uh, for homes, uh, but all of this they were going to leave behind. So in this passage, we learn how and why they were able to leave with a secure amount of money to start up in another location. Well, first of all, how, how did this happen? God tells them to ask their neighbors for gold and silver articles that each Jewish man and woman could take with them on their journey. Simple as that. No, no negotiating, no bartering or anything. He said, just ask your neighbor for articles or silver and gold. That's the how, the why. Well, the passage also gives clues as to why the Egyptians would simply give these valuable objects away to slaves who would not bring these things back or pay for them. First of all, God made the Jews favorable in the eyes of the Egyptians. Perhaps they understood that there was a, a connection between the trouble in the land and the continued enslavement of these Jews. You know, they, they, they put it together. You know, we're treating these people unfairly and these bad things are happening to us. Maybe there's a connection there. And of course, their plight and their leader, Moses, were held in high esteem by the common people as well as the Pharaoh's advisors. In other words, they were motivated to give. I realize that this transfer of portable wealth, unlike land or produce or animals, was completed in the time period between the ninth plague, you know, the darkness, and the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn. So let's uh, keep reading in Exodus chapter 11, beginning in verse four. It says, Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I'm, about, uh, I'm going out into the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones, all the firstborn uh, of the cattle as well. Moreover, there shall be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before and such as shall never be again. But against any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these, your servants, will come down to me and bow themselves before me saying, go out 
you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. So the action picks up as Moses once again before the Pharaoh announces the Lord's final blow against the Pharaoh himself and the nation. The firstborn male of every family from the Pharaoh's family down to the most humble citizen, a slave boy, as well as the firstborn of the livestock, the cattle, will all die all at once on one particular night. Now, I want you to realize that this was to happen to all the firstborn males, regardless of their age. I want to give you an idea of this uh, by using my own family. Like, let's say we were Egyptians, my family, we were Egyptians and, and uh, we were living at that time. So if we take the, the, the plague and we apply it to my family, if we were Egyptians living at that time, this is how many people would be wiped out in my family. Uh, uh, I, for example, I'm a firstborn, so I would die. And then we have four children, grown children, right? Who are married and, have, and they have children. So among our children, my son Paul, the firstborn would die. Uh, uh, Julia, our daughter's husband, Mauricio, he's a firstborn, he would die. Uh, Emily and Hal are not firstborns. Uh, William and Rebecca are not firstborns. They would, be, they would be spared. But then if you go further down to their children, well, in Paul's family, Evan uh, is uh, the youngest firstborn. Uh, he would die. In uh, Mauricio's family, his firstborn is Christian, uh, a male. He would die. Emil in uh, Emily and Hal's family would die. And in William and Rebecca's family, they're a blended family, both Daxton and Titus uh, would die. I mean, when you think of it, imagine that. that's just one family. That's eight family members out of 22. That's uh, man and boys. That's eight dead in a single family in one night. And that's just one family. Imagine if the loss occurs in every family in the nation, including all the mayors and governors and federal leaders, and then add to this the financial loss caused by the death of the cattle. Now, this hasn't happened yet, but Moses reveals to the Pharaoh what will be the final result of this plague. First, he says, it will demonstrate once and for all the might and superiority of the God of the Israelites, because the plague will fall on the Egyptians, but not on the Jews. It will also prove that the God that Moses represents favors the Jews who have nothing, not even their freedom. It favors them over the Egyptians and their Pharaoh who have a history who were a world power and possessed great wealth and a well-developed religion with temples and priests and rituals. The true God did not value or accept any of these things. And then secondly, the plague would also force the Egyptians to accept this reality and as a result, beg them to leave, beg the Jews to leave. And when you submit to these realities, Moses is saying, we will leave. At their last meeting, it was the Pharaoh that threatened Moses in anger. This time it is Moses who leaves in hot anger. So this is only speculation on my part, of course, but his anger may have been caused by the fact that he knew God was able to bring about the 10th plague and suspected the Pharaoh would resist. The idea that all of this suffering and destruction caused by one stubborn and proud man or the foolishness of trying to resist or to reject God's will. Maybe this had something to do with Moses's anger. And so we read in Exodus chapter 11, verses nine and 10, the following. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you so that my wonders will be multiplied in the land of Egypt. 
Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh, yet the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the sons of Israel go out of his, uh, out of his land, kind of a postscript there. So God's word to Moses is like a comfort of sorts. He assures Moses that the Pharaoh is the one responsible for the plagues, but through his hard heartedness, God has been able to demonstrate to the nations the power of God and also the God of the Israelites. And so the final statement in verse 10 summarizes the events surrounding the first nine plagues and it sets the stage for the 10th and final plague. It also states once again that God permitted the Pharaoh to follow the dictates of his own heart. Each time he refused to submit, his heart was naturally hardened and God permitted it to be so. And so we move on to chapter 12 where the uh, idea of the Passover is explained and we begin reading in chapter 12, verse one and two. It says, now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year uh, for you. Now you need to understand in the, in the creation of a nation, there is a birth event and the birth event for the Jewish people was their freedom from Egyptian slavery. There was you know, no future for them in Egypt. I mean, think about this for a second. The Egyptians saw them as vermin and they tried to eliminate them on several occasions by uh, killing the male children, uh, by working them to death. The Jews presented a dilemma to the Egyptians they represented profitable and free uh, labor, you know, a free workforce uh, through slave labor. However, they were so numerous that they presented a threat to the security of the nation should they mobilize and rise up or join forces with an outside nation uh, that would uh, decide to attack the Egyptians and overthrow the king. In addition to this, they were despised by the Egyptian culture. So there was no encouragement to assimilate into the Egyptian nation. Unlike when they you know, went to the promised land and there were all the Hittites and uh, all the various uh, nations that were there who would accept you know, uh, intermarrying, intermingling with them. As a matter of fact, God had warned them severely not to associate, not to commingle, not to intermarry with any of the tribes, any of the peoples of the promised land. But with the Egyptians, there was no worry about that. The Egyptians themselves uh, had no interest in assimilating uh, with the Jews. And so the Jewish people in Egypt were destined to be perpetually separated from the mainstream and relegated to the slave class and to slave labor. Therefore, God begins by giving them a calendar and a birthday, the Passover feast. And it is the first time they are referred to as the congregation of Israel, an organized community of his people. And so every time they looked at their calendar in the future, they were reminded not only of the birth of their nation, but the manner of their birth, not war, not diplomacy, but by the mighty hand of God in a miraculous way. Of course, both the Christian and Muslim religions have calendars that center on their leaders. For example, in Christianity, there's the birth of Christ, you know, before Christ, after Christ, BC, AD, that type of thing. In Islam, whose calendar is based on the flight of Muhammad, uh, the uh, Hajira uh, in AD 622, before that time and after that time. And so you have the Jewish calendar. If you take a look uh, carefully here, the Jews had a calendar, their original calendar, which was really an ancient Babylonian type calendar. 
used by uh, other nations. Um, note the civil sequence on the right column where the first month of the civil calendar began in the fall. And if you follow the months, you see that it follows the various agricultural events from plowing and sowing to the various times for harvest. So you look at the civil sequence here on the right, uh, the seventh month, uh, Nisan, March, April, so on and so forth. Uh, agriculturally, it was spring, uh, the rains, the barley and the flax harvest begins the following month. It was the barley harvest, the following month was the wheat harvest and so on and so forth. And so the calendar was uh, tied to uh, the uh, agricultural cycle that took place uh, where they lived. Now you note the sacred sequence, which is, on the, uh, which is on the left, begins when God frees them from Egypt and commemorated this birth of a nation with an initial feast called the Passover. So if you look at the sacred sequence, number one, that's the first month, the month of Abib or Nisan, uh, modern equivalent is March and April, and the feasts uh, in that time period are the Passover, the very first one given, followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread and First Fruits. And this takes place in the spring for the later rains. I mean, the culture, excuse me, the agricultural uh, cycle remains the same. It's the meaning and the sacred meaning uh, that is given by God uh, that, uh, that changes. And so God said to them, when they were in the start of the seventh agricultural month in the spring, during the barley and flax harvest, that they were to change their calendars. He said, from now on, what was normally the seventh month would now become the first month of the year for them, because it would be the time they were to be reborn as the congregation of God. And so, they had a secular calendar used by other nations based largely on the annual agricultural cycle, as well as a sacred calendar begun at the time of their exodus from Egypt, which listed the times of their religious observances and the cycle of spiritual observances that God would eventually give them. And so the first of these was to be the Passover feast, essentially commemorating the 10th plague, which led to their release from Egyptian captivity and enslavement. So let's read uh, in Exodus chapter 12 about these matters. Uh, God says to Moses, speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. There's the passage, the assembly of the congregation of Israel. That's the first time that it's mentioned in this way. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night roasted with fire and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. No leftovers. Now you shall eat it in this manner with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, 
and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So these are the instructions concerning the first ever Passover meal or feast. On the 10th day of the first month of the sacred calendar, the month of Nisan, they were to procure an unblemished lamb, a male one year old or goat, male one year old. Then on the 14th of the month, they were to conduct the first Passover meal. Moses goes on to explain the elements, the procedure and the reasons for the Passover meal and its protective significance in relation to the 10th plague. The angel of death would pass over the houses that were covered with the blood of the sacrificial lamb. Today, in a theological term, we would call that a vicarious atonement. The, the lamb, the Passover, represented a vicarious atonement. Someone else, something else, was making a sacrifice uh, to pay uh, and to protect another individual. It was vicarious and the atonement was a payment. Uh, someone else making a payment of their lives in order to protect another person. As I say, in this case, it was the lamb. The blood represented its life. The blood on the doorposts and the, on the lintel uh, uh, provided a covering, if you wish, a protection of that, of that family. Moses, uh, as I say, explains all of this uh, and then finishes by saying the angel of death would pass over the houses covered with the blood of the sacrificial, uh, sacrificial lamb. Now in the next section, he explains other observances that they will keep in the future that will accompany the Passover meal when they celebrate it as a yearly commemoration and not as a, a guard or an act of faith concerning uh, a plague. And that is the feast of unleavened bread. Again, uh, the Jews would come to understand that leaven represented evil and its effect. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, was uh, done in the following way. Before the 14th uh, of Nisan, uh, all leaven was removed uh, from the house. On the 14th day uh, of, uh, of Nisan, there would be worship in the day and they would eat the Passover meal that night. And then from the 14th to the 21st, those seven days, they would eat only unleavened bread. And then finally on the 21st uh, of that month, they would have a day of worship. And this would be a perpetual observance each year. They didn't do it you know, on the night of you know, the Passover, but the instructions were given uh, for them to do this you know, in the, following, in the following years. A little calendar note, the feast of first fruits will be initiated later. We see that on our calendar, but it was not initiated uh, at this particular time. Now in Exodus 12 verses 21, 28, we don't have time to read, but Moses recounts how the Jews followed his instructions concerning the Passover meal with the elders being the first to make uh, preparations. Moses also explains how to use this sacred meal to teach future generations about how God freed the people from slavery with the 10th plague uh, and how only the firstborn of the Egyptians were taken, but the Israelites who obeyed God were saved and consequently uh, earned or gained their freedom. So we continue reading in Exodus chapter 12, beginning in verse 29. It says, now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. 
and all the firstborn of cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone uh, dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said and go and bless me also. The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we will all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls bound up in the clothes on their shoulders. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have their request. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. So we see here, just as Moses had warned on the first moment of the, of the next day, midnight, every firstborn of every family from the highest Pharaoh to uh, the lowest, you know, the prisoner in the dungeon, uh, the firstborn was killed and it affected every household in the nation. In addition to this, the loss uh, was terrible because they also uh, had the economic loss of the cattle uh, that, was, uh, that was destroyed on that night. Note the response of the Pharaoh to Moses who was summoned in the middle of the night. Take all of your people, take all of your flocks and all of your herds, leave immediately to worship your God and then bless me also. The Pharaoh finally gives in, not, not to also believe and serve the true God, but that Moses' God is more powerful than himself and his gods. And he's still negotiating. He asks for a blessing, a kind of a consolation prize for you know, having come in in second. You know, I'm letting you go, at you know, least you could do is bless me. More likely, it was a request that the plagues would stop, a request based more on uh, pragmatism than faith. You know, yes, okay, we have the plague, you know, the, the children and people are dead and cattle destroyed, you know, okay, go, go away. And the idea is, and stop the plagues, you know, bless me also, please let this be the end of the plagues, you win, goodbye. So this attitude is reflected in the Egyptian people as well. Instead of rising up and attacking the people responsible for devastating their country, like their king, they beg the Jews to leave immediately and they provide them with abundant gifts of gold and silver for their journey out of fear of more plagues that might kill them all. So the Jews leave quickly in the night with only the basic necessities and no more than they can carry along with the dough unleavened because there's no time to rise because they're in a rush to go as Moses had instructed them. The last verse in the section refers to the gold and silver they were given, which it seems also uh, impoverished the uh, Egyptian uh, population. You know, it was plundered. And the word plunder means to take by force, usually in a time of chaos or war. One commentator suggests that the Egyptians were benefactors of the free and forced labor provided by the Jewish people in their country. This money therefore was compensation for what they should have been given for their work. In other words, they had immediate reparations from those who directly profited from the forced labor given to the ones who actually provided it on the day they were set free. Imagine that type of emancipation. Imagine if that could have happened, you know, the ones who had enslaved the slaves paid them everything that they were owed on the day that they were freed. Of course, that's not the way that it happened, but that's the way that it happened uh, in Egypt. God remembers everything, doesn't he? He arranges for everything. I want to draw a lesson from, from this. We've, we've spoken a lot about these plagues and their effect, but I don't want us to lose sight of some important ideas. So here's a lesson. 
God judges and punishes in real time. We see it in the Old Testament. You know, we have this idea that God's judgment and actual punishment of a person or a nation happened in real time, meaning here on earth, but it only happened in the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament where judgment and punishment will only take place at the end of the world when Jesus returns. Of course, the New Testament teaches that there will be a final judgment and consequences when Jesus comes. For example, in Hebrews chapter nine, verse 27, it says, and in as much as uh, it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment, right? In Acts 24, 25, it says, but as he was discussing righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, go away for the present. And when I find time, I will summon you. You know, Felix was afraid of judgment and in his mind, judgment now. This, however, doesn't mean that God reserves his judgment about matters only for the end of time or the end of the world. When we pray, we ask God to act on our behalf in real time, don't we? I mean, we ask him to change something or we ask him to stop something or start something or provide something that we need that will change our lives. Well, here's my point. Uh, what, what makes us think the, that in New Testament times, God can't exercise judgment and punishment in real time, in the same way that he provides blessings in real time? I mean, King Herod was immediately struck down and died for not giving God the glory in Acts chapter 12. That was judgment in real time. Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, both instantly were struck dead for lying to the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter five, verses one to nine. That, that, was, that was punishment, that was judgment in real time. You know, the plagues were a, a historical miracle and God uh, also works in real time to bless our lives and our ministries in our time as well. However, he also frustrates the plan of evil, evil men and women, and he can strike down those that he chooses to whenever he chooses to do so. So this is the point. God can bring judgment down on individuals or nations in real time, not only at the end of the world. So here are two lessons that we can draw uh, from this reality. The first of which is heed the warning. Heed the warning, pay attention. In Ecclesiastes 7 verse 17, the, uh, Solomon says, do not be excessively wicked and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? In other words, why should you be judged in real time? You know, the fools of this world try to cheat death in return for attention or money. Be careful not to gamble with the life God gave you. He can always take it back anytime he desires to. The evil, unbelieving and ruthless people who think that their power and their ruthlessness are their protection will one day answer for their sins. But sometimes, like the Pharaoh, God judges and punishes them in their prime just to show them and the world who is God and who is not God. And then maybe a, a second thing that we can learn from this idea is let's pray for big as well as little things, shall we? In Matthew 19, verse 26, Jesus said, and looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. You know, we, we pray for better health. We pray for success for our children, the winning of a soul or safety in travel, that we sell our home on time and find another home at a reasonable price, as well as a thousand other little things. And we know that God hears our prayers and we know that he can answer them in real time. I'm saying we should also pray for big things that he stop wars, 
that he frustrate the plans of evil and godless governments and movements and ideologies. In other words, we want him, uh, we, in our prayers, we want him to do big things. We want to pray for big things. And why is that? Because with God, nothing is impossible. And my question to you is, what is it about nothing that we don't understand? Nothing is impossible with God. That your mother is healed from her illness, uh, that you succeed on your exam, or that an evil government is stopped from doing the evil that it is doing. Nothing is impossible with God. So let's remember that, shall we, in our prayers. Sometimes, you know, uh, this is not my saying, but uh, it's a familiar saying, but I just want to remind you of it. Sometimes our God is too small. You know, we think of him being too small, uh, but nothing is impossible with God. The only thing too small at times is our prayers. Sometimes it's our prayers that are too small. So let's think big and, that, and let's pray big uh, as well, because one more time, nothing is impossible with God. All right, well, that's the end of the lesson, the end of our, you know, the plagues. We're gonna continue next time uh, with the story of the actual exodus of the people of uh, Israel uh, from Egypt. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>